Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the annual Rabbi Marshall Meyer Social Justice Great Issues Lecture. I am Chris Woolforth, Acting Director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. I'm delighted to be here to introduce our distinguished speaker. I'm joined in welcoming you today um, by my colleagues Richard Crocker, Director of the Tucker Foundation, and Susanna Heschel from the Department of Religion, who join me each year in selecting the speaker for this annual lecture. Those of you arriving a bit early will have learned a little bit about Rabbi Marshall Meyer, a tireless advocate for social justice issues in whose name this lecture is offered every year. This opportunity is made possible through the generous support of Andrew Lewin, class of 81, and his wife Marina, who admired Rabbi Meyer and who through their endowment of this lecture have ensured that social justice issues are perpetually and forever considered a great issues through our series. We are very fortunate to have Andrew Lewin with us this afternoon, and so I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking him, and by extension to his wife as well, who could not be with us, uh, for giving us this opportunity today. So thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Social justice is indeed an enduring great issue. It's often a cause requiring the advocacy of some for the many who are unable to advocate for themselves. Selection of our social justice great issues lecturer thus requires serious consideration of the impact our guest has had on those whom society and history have neglected. The impact of our speaker today will shortly become apparent, um, has been great, and her appropriateness uh, valid for, for our lecture. Zainab Salbi is the founder of Women for Women International, a grassroots development organization helping women survivors of wars rebuild their lives and their communities. Since its founding in 1993, which ironically was also the year of Rabbi Marshall Meyer's death, and I like to think that some of his spirit perpetuated out into the world and, and was part of the inspiration for, for this organization. Since 1993, the organization has helped over 315,000 women survivors of war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Rwanda, Kosovo, Nigeria, Colombia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Sudan. And it's helped these women access social and economic opportunities through a program of rights awareness training, vocational skills education, and access to income generating opportunities. The organization has distributed over $103 million in direct aid and microcredit loans, and through its work with women survivors of war, has reached nearly two million additional family members. Ms. Salby received her undergraduate degree from George Mason University in sociology and women's studies. She received a master's degree in development studies from the London School of Economics. She served as Women for Women International's CEO from 2003 to 2011. She is also herself a survivor. As she chronicles in her memoir, Between Two Worlds, Escape from Tyranny, Growing Up in the Shadow of Saddam, she grew up in the close confines of Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist regime in Iraq, which she then escaped to the United States through an arranged marriage. Sadly, this marriage proved to be yet another tyranny from which she also escaped. She has since used her education and her experiences, both personal and professional, on behalf of uh, and uh, to be an advocate for women, and in particular, women survivors of war, those who are not killing, nor pillaging and plundering, nor destroying, nor raping, but those who keep life going during a conflict and who are essential to the rebuilding of communities should peace come. Her advocacy has earned her and Women for Women International many honors, awards, and accolades. Women for Women International was awarded the Conrad N. Hilton Humanitarian Prize in 2006, the very first time such an award has been given to a women's organization. Ms. Salby herself received the 2010 David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award, was named to the Executive Clinton Global Initiative Lead Program, and has been named a top woman activist and campaigner, a female faith heroine, one of the 100 extraordinary women who shake the world, 
and one of the most inspirational women in the world by The Guardian, the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, Newsweek Daily Beast, and the Economist Intelligence Unit, respectively. She is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and a member of the United Nations Secretary General Civil Society Advocacy Group focusing on UN Security Resolution 1325, the resolution which urges all actors to increase the participation of women and incorporate gender perspectives in all United Nations peace and security efforts. Her 2010 TED Talk eloquently urges that women have a seat at the negotiating table following conflict, since they are the primary peacekeepers. In addition to her memoir, she has written a book, The Other Side of War, Women's Stories of Survival and Hope, on which her presentation today is based. So please join me in extending a very well, warm welcome to Zainab Salbi. Well, thank you very, very much for this sweet introduction and very generous one. It is an absolute honor to be in your company today and to be in this beautiful campus. Um, you know, I really just wanted to start by saying it all starts here. And I know it's maybe confusing. This is a women's rights activist standing in front of you and not a new age um, guru. <laughs> But I have come around after really 20 years of doing the work. <coughs> First 20 years of my life living in wars, and the second 20 years of my life, well, no, I just turned 43, mind you, um, working in wars. And I have traveled around after going to war zones in Bosnia and Congo and Rwanda and Southern Sudan. I really just came a full circle to understand that, oh my God, it all starts from here. Now, you almost have no choice. You can actually do the work without starting from here. In a way, I did that. So you go and go outward looking and start looking and how do you serve? And I'm talking about those who are interested in social justice and in serving in any way, shape, or form. I chose to serve women. You may have chosen to do something else, or you may choose to do something else. But if you choose to serve in any shape or form, you really have two choices. You can still serve without starting from here. It's possible. It's just never going to be completed. And it will not get you to where you want to go. Now. If all what I'm going to do is share a journey that you will take only 10% of it, maybe 1% of it, for those who are just starting your careers and your life, then it is worth it. You see, first of all, there are few merits of serving. You can serve. But it's the, the biggest dismay or fallacy if we think that in serving there is peace building. Allow me to get deeper on this point. The Dalai Lama, a year ago, I had the honor of meeting him. And he said, if you cannot respect those you are serving, is this better? If you cannot respect those you are serving, then better not serve them. Now, it's really, this sentence really stayed with me. And I really not only shared it with a lot of people, but I really simmered on it. If you cannot respect those you are serving, then better not serve them. And what I came to realize after a discussion with an Iraqi woman, who during not this war in Iraq, the, the Kuwait war. You know, in Iraq we have many wars, and when you grow up in Iraq or when you go to Iraq, you say, oh, which war you grew uh, Did you live in the war? And people say, which war? You know, I'm, you know it's my, my brother is in his 30s, and he lived through three wars. So, it's, uh, so she went through this experience in the second war, the war with Kuwait, in which there were three weeks where they ran out of food. Completely, there was only the women and the children in the house, and they run out of food. 
she talks that the only thing they had is the leftover from, you know, back home we cleaned the, the flour with the, I don't know what you call it, a sieve, right. So you have a leftover, the dirt basically that comes out of the flour. They only had that and they baked that. So basically like a rock of a bread. And finally, after three weeks, her brother-in-law came with a sack of rice and a sack of flour with the name Kuwait on it. Now, she's Iraqi. So it was obvious that it was stolen food. She said, we knew it was stolen food, but we were hungry. And we had no choice but to eat it, eat it even though we know stealing is a sin. A sin. So we cooked it in silence. We baked the bread, we cooked the rice, we ate all the women and the children. My brother-in-law stayed on the side, could not eat. And after we put the kids to sleep, he came to us and he said, you know, this is stolen food. And she said, we looked at him and we said, we know that. And we know it is a sin to steal, but we are hungry. So we are eating it. Now I have, I get emotion when I think about this story. But it's a story that illuminates for me that when you are hungry, and it is something that I have personally not experienced and very grateful that I have not experienced. And so you should be very, very grateful in case you are not, that you have not experienced hungry. So I'm constantly trying to learn what it means to be hungry. You can't serve if you do not understand, right? So when I talk to Radia, the Iraqi woman, she talks about that moment where it did not matter where the food came from. <coughs> Even if it was from a sinful place, haram in Arabic. It did not matter. She could have gotten it from stolen place. She could have gotten it from a helicopter, someone dropping the food on it. She could have gotten it from a humanitarian aid worker. She could have gotten it from someone who gave her food begging in the street. It did not matter for her as she wanted to eat. Now, from a giver perspective, we often confuse the act of giving with building peace. And in her case, no, she just wanted to eat. If you really wanted to build peace, it's a very different exchange on a different level. You see, I went a whole year last year talking about what the Dalai Lama said because I was so curious. If you can't respect the person you're serving, then better not serve them. And to my surprise and absolute hurt, I discovered about 20% of people who said to me, no, we don't give out of respect. Now, fine, but don't confuse that with peace building. Because she's not taking that. Just because we give our secondhand clothes or our charity or our things, something we all do at some points of our lives, if not all the times. The person who is receiving is not necessarily saying, this is peace building. Peace requires something else. Peace requires that you not only come with sympathy and respect, but you build, you meet the very person you are trying to serve, a person to a person. Meet them with your story, not as the savior, not as the humanitarian, Definitely not as the person who is all intact. Because no one is. I don't know about you, but God, if you have really figured it out and you are in this equilibrium in your life, then God bless, you should be the giving the lecture. I can only talk to you about my struggle in the process. And when I came as the educated uh, woman who's trying to serve these women, help them, I have constantly, it's been a battle of humiliation over and over and over again until I came to realize if I, the serving requires not the fact that I have and they don't, 
not the fact that I know and they don't, but the fact that I come with my knowing and not knowing. And I come with my having and not having and with my full story and present it to the person I'm trying to serve as the biggest act of respect. Now, I tried. <coughs> After all, I was going through the journey without starting from here first. So let me share what, what I mean by what I just said. One experience and, you know, gosh, many experiences. My first, I was 23 when I started with women, when I started Women for Women International. I had no job experience. I had no work experience. I had nothing. I was 23. I was a recent refugee from Iraq. I, my family was in Iraq. I was stranded by myself in America. And there was Bosnia, a country that I had no idea who they are, what they are, everything, nothing. I don't have any affiliation with Bosnia. But there was war, and there were rape camps, and there were concentration camps. And there are women who were given numbers, and when their numbers were called, they had to go to another room and get gang raped as they were in their rape camp. And I was taking, at the time, a, holo uh, a class on the Holocaust. And then I was like, for the first time, I'm learning that in Iraq, no one taught us about that. But in America, I was learning, oh, never again, and all of that. And there was Newsweek and Times Magazine coverage on the concentration camps in Bosnia. So the only drive I had is that, that there was something wrong. We promised ourselves as humanity not to do it, and it happened again. And I went to a strange land with strange people. I have no nothing in common, and they have become my family now. Now... And I went from the perspective, I have a degree in sociology from George Mason University and um, a, a master's degree from LSE. And that was the biggest humbling experience. First, I said this organization is to serve women survivors of rape. Only rape victims can come. And uh, the women, they're like, n n no. We are vulnerable and we do need help, but if you're going to create an organization where there are going to be a line of people, of women, only rape victims, you're going to stigmatize us. But you see, from this perspective, from this end, people only want to help rape victims or only want to help widows or only want to help single mothers. That's what's appealing for, you know, to fundraise and to get media attention and all of that. The women there, they're like, uh-uh, you either help us all or you don't help us. And in the process, they showed me not only the raped victim, but they showed me the mother who escaped with her two sons from a house in Bosnia from a small village. And she kept on, she, as she was telling me the story, she said, we kept on turning around and seeing our house being burnt. And in the description of the story, she's crying and shaking. And there was nothing in me that knew, everything in me knew that she deserved as much help as a rape victim does. But in here, we had the projection, only this category deserve help. This woman was not raped, was not a widow. Was a woman who saw her house burning and all her memories and belongings. There was a time in which we launched microcredit program and I wanted to help a woman start a business plan in Bosnia again and uh, she wanted to do chicken now I have moved from being a very city girl who had no idea about anything in nature when I saw a bird I was like whatever now I am in love with nature I just like all my learnings are in nature the women that I thought I'm serving taught me that so she wanted to have a chicken farm as her business. And I was helping her calculate. And I, you know, was, you know, saying, okay, how many chicken you need to have and how much is an egg and what kind of food and shelter and inoculation and all of these things. And really, I'm learning about chicken. I'm just doing, helping her do her business plan. And then I said, well, how many eggs a chicken give a day? That's when I lost complete credibility. Completely. Anything in my, all my degrees, all my knowledge did not go anywhere. She looked at me and she, she didn't say it, but I felt it more like, seriously, you're going to help me? One egg. A chicken give one egg a day. Now I see people who know that in this audience. Usually most people, out of thousands of people, couple of people hand, you know, raise their hands and, and say one eggs. I actually now have chicken myself and, and have eggs, so I 
pretty much no, although I feel violation every time I steal the eggs. But, you know, <laughs> but it's a simple knowledge, simple knowledge about life. And I came to the conclusion that I may have my degrees. I may have read theory of so-and-so and the theory of so-and-so and the discipline of so-and-so and this economic theory and this development theory and this feminist theory, but the answer does not lie here only. Half of the answer lies there. Are the very people you are trying to serve they know most of the times the solution. What you have is access to knowledge. That is what is a documentary of what happened in this country, in this country, in this theory, in this theory. What you have is access to resources, and that is a blessing. But what we don't necessarily have is the ultimate solution. Only if we meet halfway can we find the sustainable solution. <coughs> the lasting solution. And the other half is met by the very people we are trying to serve. Now, if you do not respect those you are serving, you will never hear their solutions. You will only dismiss their solutions as primitive and uneducated and ignorant and all of these things. But if you only hear them, you will find there are lots of the solutions already lying there. Sometimes it's as simple as, if I may switch to a very simple example actually, in the last war in Iraq, in the American, uh, this, this last war in Iraq 10 years ago, when I first went right after the invasion, Iraqis would stop me in the street. I'm, I am from Iraq, so they, they figured that I, uh, whatever, they heard me speak English and they figured I'm somewhere in between. So they would tell me, like strangers would grab me and they say, please, Tell American soldiers they are working too. They are wearing too many layers of clothes, and it's very hot in here, and 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 they will snap at us because it is really really hot, and we cannot afford them to snap at us. We are traumatized people. We cannot afford them to snap at us. We will explode if they do. Very right. I mean, like I almost laughed the first time I heard them. I heard people telling me that. But literally, people were grabbing me in the street, and they say, "Please tell the Americans. Please tell the Americans." <coughs> now it's 120 to 140 degrees in Iraq, and people do lose. I mean, believe me, I practice yoga and meditation every day, and I lose everything when I'm there. It is really, really hot, you know. And you lose your balance when you are there. And so people were afraid that American soldiers who are wearing 50 pounds on their clothes that they will snap at them. Basic thing. I'm not telling change the attire of American soldiers, but I'm saying pay attention to that, that they, what they're saying, that we are traumatized people. We cannot have someone, we are not in balance. And we cannot have someone poke us in a different way, even if it's by accident, even if it's not intentional because we will explode. We're barely holding it together. Basic, basic, basic things. But if you do not respect the people you're serving, you'll never be able to hear them. The second, the third point that I wanted to share is that within the respect, now there's, we're often, you, we have to understand, the respect is not only respecting you as a different culture or a different religion or whatever, or curious, or understanding you know, what hunger means, but also respect. And this is odd to say, but I will say it. In the underlining structures of the very thing we oppose, the very thing we are there to actually fight and change, the very injustice that we're trying to change. And, and I tell you that out of, you know, if you go to southern Sudan and you say, oh my God, they're horrible, horrible people, for every, you know, for a woman, for a girl to be married, uh, you know, she, they, ex they exchange girls for, for uh, cows as dowries. Usually in southern Sudan, your dowry as a girl is about 30 to 100 cows, depends on how tall you are. I got propositioned and got offered 30 cows, and when I rejected that, he said, well, you are short. <laughs> you know, I said, I have a degree in here, but, you know, so that's the culture, right? 
Now you can go outside of it and you can criticize it. It's horrible. It's an exchange of girls and women in a horrible, degrading way. They're cows for women. Are you kidding me? We're in a time where women are independent and all of these things. Now, you can go that. Actually, I'm telling you, 90% of people do have this attitude. You won't be a loner in here. I'm just trying to spare some of it. Take 10%, 1% of what I'm saying, and hopefully it will go somewhere, you know? But the people you're serving have an underlining economic reason for why this happens. There's a whole economic structure in the oppression itself. Don't think that I'm happy that women are being exchanged for cows. I'm a, I, my, my utter belief, my whole existence in this world is to get to a stage, to see a stage, and if I contribute to it 0.1%, that I would be a very grateful person, where we live all in a land where every woman has the freedom to make whatever choice she wants to make. That's all what I mean. She could be having bad choices, good choices, right choices, wrong choices, it doesn't matter for me, as long as she has the opportunity to make her choices in life. Now, so I'm not necessarily excited about cows for women. But you cannot ever change it if your outlook on it is discussed. You cannot ever change it. It will go nowhere. I met with educated Southern Sudanese women who says that's our culture. Now, they're not against changing, but change replace a system with another system. You know, it's like, how do I say it? My vision of it is that if you do not go with an utter curiosity, even about darkness, and there are lots of places in this world that are the heart of darkness, if you don't go with utter curiosity to understand it, out of a place of respect, then you cannot change it. Perhaps my most humbling experience was actually in a brothel in India. I was sitting with a brothel owner doing a story on him for CNN. And, and he was talking about, got to a stage where he talked about how he buys girls who are stolen from their families, how he buys them in front of them, how he negotiates their price in front of them, and he says, okay, so you're gonna have to work for, with me, for me, for five years for free until you pay off your debts. How, he, how a girl manage or a woman manage up to 15 men a day. That's physical torture. Physical torture for a woman to have sex with 15 men a day. And a lot of them are nine-year-old. They start at nine-year-old girls. How, how he talks about his charging rate. How he talks about everything. And then he looks at me, and I'm horrified. And he looks at me, and it was really one of the humbling moments in my life. And he said, you all judge us. You judge us. You judge the brothel owners. You judge the prostitutes. You judge the red light districts. You all judge us. You put us all in prison. You have us all criminalized, all of these things. No, I think what he's doing is the heart of darkness. For those of you who have been in a red light district, it is as awful as the heart of war in Congo. It is darkness and, and how horrifying it is. And he says, but you judge us. And you've never taken accountability that it is you, outside of this district, that you create the demands. It is your brothers, and it's your fathers, and it's your sons, and it's your colleagues. You are the ones who are creating the demands. But you come and you criticize us, and you criminalize us, and you put these women who are abused to start with. I stole these women. I bought these women. I forced them to have sex 15 times a day, and you then put them in prison. Now, I tell you this experience, and I am not for legalize, legalizing these things, so it doesn't matter. That's not the issue. The issue is the only way you can actually embark on a discussion if he seriously opens up to you. And if you understand the logic of that darkness, so you can replace it with a viable economic alternative, with a viable logic. 
because we criminalize prostitution and we put her to prison and then when she leaves we all ostracize her because she's been a prostitute and we do not talk to her and we do not buy from her and we make fun of her and we tell all our jokes that I am sure some of you have been in jokes uh, in groups where there's a joke about a prostitute and we all laugh I have been and you have, and she has no choice but to go back from the very heart of darkness that she has been escaping. Because I have not met any woman who likes what that world is. So if we cannot go at that darkness, if we go with like a, I call it like an astronaut suit, you know, making judgments of horrible, primitive, evil, all of these things, then you know what? We do give food. And we do give money, but we do not gain respect. And it is not a bridge of peace. But if you go with your heart intact and open, and you meet the person, person to person, then you may have a chance to go see that darkness, come out of it intact, and bring hope inside. You see, in my, after 18 years of running Women for Women International, I decided to, I decided that I don't want to be much older and before I, and, and holding on to my organization. I wanted to leave at the peak of its growth and hand over leadership to model that it is okay <laughs> to leave and evolve at the peak of his growth. So in my farewell year, I went to all the women, all the countries we worked in, and asked, what is it that women want? What is it that women in war zones want? What is it that, uh, what, what is the agent of change? Is it the sponsorship program? You know, I don't know if you know, at Women for Women International, we ask every woman to sponsor one woman at a time by sending her $30 a month and exchanging pictures and letters with her for a year. Or is it the educational training program? Well, during that year, every woman is grouped with another 30, uh, 25 women. And they go through an educational program to learn about her rights and education and politics and economy and society. Or is it the vocational skills training? Well, we're saying that awareness is important, money is important, but if she doesn't have access to get a job, then all of this goes nowhere. So we teach her vocational business skills to help her stand up on her feet and earn a living. So I go, I interview so many women. I have a book coming up on all of these things. All of the interviews is called If You Knew Me, You Would Care. Until I discovered in the process, and one colleague from Bosnia held my hand. This is 18 years of work for me. I have put everything in my soul in it. And she said, Zainab, but all women want is inspiration. And I realized that, and I, then I started doing the interviews with this in mind. In inspiration, she means, inspiration comes, you know, it's so easy. That's what each one of us own it. It's not the humanitarian worker who won the Conrad Hilton Award <laughs> or named the Extraordinary Woman or whatever is doing it. It's each one of us is doing inspiration is in our stories. If we each take ownership of our story, Break our silence, share it, and in the process, that may be the lantern, the candle, the flashlight on another woman's life that inspire her to do the change. I met Arwandi, I met women after women at the end of the day, and I realized, oh my God, all what it takes is inspiration. A woman in Rwanda who was, who was the only survivor of the genocide from her family met another man who was the only, whose wife was killed rather in the genocide in the family and had three kids. They marry all of these things, and he beat the heck out of her. He's so cruel that he doesn't beat her on her face. He, is, he beat her in the back of her head so no one can know that he was doing this to her. And she thought that this is it. This is her destiny. Until she heard another woman, not women for women, 
not a TV program, not a radio. She heard another woman, a neighbor, who went and who was in the same situation and went and learned to make beads and made necklaces. And from the necklaces, she started buying furniture and she started sending the, the kids to school. And she said, I went to her house and she has sofas and furniture. And she has a nice man, not any man, a nice man. And she talks and she sees hope. And she says, oh, I can do it again. Then if she can do it, I can do it. And that was the process in which she then joins the organization and then goes and transforms her life. What I'm trying to say is this inspiration happens when each one of us tell our stories. And we talk about our triumph and our challenges and how we have overcome this. Now, please, in case you have this in mind, please don't tell it to me. Because between now and then, I get people who say, I'm so sorry, I don't have your story. I have no story. I don't have your story as in, you know, yes, my father was Saddam Hussein's pilot. I grew up knowing Saddam Hussein. I was raped. I was, you know, I was a refugee. I was poor. I don't know. It's like, I don't have your story. Please, seriously, if you have not gone through this, don't feel bad for yourself. But let me tell you something. Everyone has a story. And that story, it is the story to your heart. And if you have done the story, I, you are my Dalai Lama. Because that's the heart story. Where you can find your peace. Where you can find your equilibrium inside your heart. You see, the very women I thought I was serving end up being my saviors. In Congo, last year, I met Nanbitu. And Nanbitu was not a poor victim woman. She was high school educated. She fell in love with a mechanical engineer, and they eloped, and they got married, and they have three kids, and he's doing well, and they have a nanny in their home, and they have a baby, and one day the rebels came, and the rebels took everything, pillaged everything from the house, and they took the mother, Nambitu, with few other mothers from the neighborhood. I'll make the story short. They drag her a few nights in the bush to walk until they got to the rebel village, the first thing they do is slit the throat of another woman as a sacrifice to the rebel leader. He likes them, be too. He gets, he, he offers two rounds of bullets and two sacks of uh, beer for her captor. And he locks her in the room and he rapes her for three months, day in and day out. She couldn't even go to the bathroom without escort. One, I asked Nambitu, who had since left escaped he helped her escape actually the day of her uh, the day she was supposed to be killing killed he said i cannot see you die so he gives her uh, his military uniform a stick to pretend that it's a machine gun 30 dollars and he helps her escape i ask her what does peace means for you she says peace is inside my heart no one can take it from me and no one can give it to me. This is Nambitu, locked in a room for three months. You know, I don't know about you, but I am still in search for that peace inside my heart. I get glimpses of it, and it's fantastic when you feel it. <laughs> But I would never be able to articulate it the way Nambi to articulate it. That's the warrior journey. If you meet the very people with your story, not because you were raped or not raped, you were a refugee or not refugee, you were poor or not poor, not, this is not relevant. The relevant part is how did you get to your peace inside your heart? And in that story, there is an inspiration for someone else. And in that inspiration, there is a bridge being built of peace that has nothing to do with food. Though food is important, just don't confuse the two. 
though money is important, though a job is very important because it's all about integrity and dignity of a person. But if you don't do it from here, then you just can't do it. You just can't do it. And in order, you can't create change if you have not been aware of what change means inside your life. Now, we go to all these communities, right? And we talk about social change and the change in social norms. And how do we get a woman to understand her value from, you know, someone who is worthless to someone who has a power of, of a voice? How can we get a man to stop beating his wife? How do, we, how do we get all these, you know, people, poor people in Afghanistan and Iraq and in Rwanda and Southern Sudan to do all of these things? And, and we expected with our metrics and measurements, which we all want and all these concepts, to do it like this. And if an organization or a group or you or but if you don't do it in this period, then we are failed. Now, unless you know change in your life and how hard it is, you can never appreciate the change we are talking about. I mean, how many of you just struggle to change your routine from not exercising to exercising? Or, no, I'm serious. Or eating junk food to stopping eating junk food. I'm, or smoking and stopping to smoke. Or, I mean, how hard is this? Tell me. Everybody go, it's not easy at all. I have to drag myself and have a million notes in my room so I can go to my yoga class at 7.15 in the morning. It's not easy to have this change. Now, we expect, okay, someone who has gone through, you know, hell to go through the change in a year. And I'm not telling you that as not someone who's very proud of Women for Women. We just got audited by KPMG, not only on financial, but on our social impact. And they said they've never seen any, any group who has uh, never seen such rapid social change in a person's life in such a period, short period of time. So I'm telling you some this as someone who is very proud. And it's not, if it happens, oh my God, that's fantastic. But for all of us to expect that third world, that world who had just gone through hell in war, to change like this, and I'm not exaggerating about hell, by the way. No, I'm not at all. It is literally, sometimes it is hell. I have, you know, whether it's Nabitu, you've only heard Nabitu's story or Radia's story. I've had, I've met women whose legs were cut into pieces and cooked and their children were forced to eat them. That is hell. So the, um, the war is nothing, I mean, nothing, nothing glamorous about it. Nothing, nothing glamorous about it. So if we expect people who have gone through this hell to change just like that while we are still struggling to go to the gym every day, then we have unrealistic understanding. And that's what I'm saying. It's the journey starts from here. If you are not aware of you, you cannot create change in her. You just cannot do that. Now... I know I was supposed to talk about the other side of war, which is usually what I talk about. What I wrote in that book was about all seeing, women, seeing wars and peace from a woman's perspective. Because we see war and peace only as men see it. And it's not wrong what men see. They see the frontline discussion. They see the battles, the politics of war and peace. It is a very real thing of what men see, but it's not the full story. <coughs> not the full story. The story is that there is another side of war, and that is what women see. If men lead the frontline discussion, then women lead the backline discussion. If, women, if men lead the discussion of fighting and the troops and the planes and the bullets and the tanks and all of these things, then women are leading the food and the hospitals and the schools and the factory and all of these things. They keep life going. 
And the reason we, we need to understand war and peace, as I argue, not only from a man's perspective, but from a woman's perspective, is only so we can have a real peace. Because when a peace is being determined by those on, who are fighting or seeing the frontline discussion, the politics of it, then it becomes only about the ending of fighting. And if it's seen as the full spectrum of what it is, it's about food. One woman in Congo, when I asked her, what does peace mean for you? She said, food. When we understand peace as about food and about jobs, another woman from Bosnia, she said, jobs, give me any job. Let me clean your home. Let me cook for you. Give me any job. I just need a job. If we don't understand peace from the very <coughs> intimate aspects of life, then we are missing on the interpretation of peace. And we are missing on the interpretation of peace. Right now, America is negotiating halfway through, if not three quarters through, with, Afga with the Taliban. And Afghan women are saying, are you kidding? You are sacrificing. When, not, when you don't include us and you do not protect us in the process of this negotiation, we cannot have lasting peace in Afghanistan. <coughs> So when we don't see it as a woman's perspective, we're simply missing out. Everyone is missing out on the definition of peace. But that was a book I wrote five years ago. And it was all about stories of women, of how women saw peace and war. And I came a full circle, a full circle to understanding that yes, there is the other side of war but the other side of war and peace is not only in the women's stories. It is also in the intimate stories. It is also in the intimate stories. Take, don't take me wrong. I have dedicated my life to serving women. I think women have been marginalized to such a, a bad extent that has been negatively impacting us all and in, in, in the world stability. And that is not a third world issue. I argue that women's marginalization is a global issue. There are as many women who are marginalized in this country as there are other countries. The extremity of which, the extremity of the marginalization may be different, very different from America to Afghanistan, but that <laughs> Lacking of full inclusion exists everywhere. We have only 3% of women, who, of, of voices that control the media are women. Only 3% of all the media editorial voices are women. We have only 2.2% of all peace negotiating agreements signed by women. We have about only 15% of political representation worldwide by women. And the marginalization include corporations, my God. I mean, we're lucky, we get excited, we celebrate when a corporation gets two board members who are women out of 15 or 20 or 50. It's in the press release. We are nowhere full, we are nowhere near the inclusion, the full inclusion of women. The trafficking of women and girls is the second to third largest illegal industries along with drugs and arms. Just to give you perspective, 300,000 people are trafficked in this country a year. You take any issue, any issue, environmental issue, and you'll see women are marginalized the most. They are the ones who have to carry water every two hours a day on average in places like Southern Sudan. I asked a woman in Southern Sudan, what does peace mean for you? She says, water. No, really, after water, what is peace? Water. But really, after, no, I just really want water because she walks two hours each direction to carry gallons of, work, of water. If you want to talk about a green movement is impacting women, if you want to talk about food productions, women are 80%, 70 to 80% of the farmers of the world. They produce 60% of the food of the world. They earn less than 10% of the income and they own less than 2% less than of the land. Complete marginalization. You give me, if you take violence, three out of five women are violated in this country, or rather worldwide, I think it's one out of five women in this country. And if you want to know more, watch Nick Kristoff's Half the Sky movie on the PBS. 
But you take any issue and you will find women are at the heart of it. And yet women, when we talk about discussions and solutions and uh, theories and development strategies, women are at the margin of it. I still attend discussions on ending poverty and new goals on poverty and all of that where I am one of two women in it. Even though everyone knows that you know, those who are impacted by poverty the most are women. There hasn't been there. We have, if we are climbing a mountain, we are halfway in the mountain. We are not on the top of the mountain yet. There's more awareness, there's more clarity, but we are not fully there yet. Now, I'm telling you that as a women's rights activist, and I'm telling you the other side of war is not only laying with women, it also starts here. It also starts here. Only if I tell my full story and own it and meet the very woman with my full story, a person to a person. So, some of you are young, some of you are younger. <laughs> As you, well, I just turned 43 and I tell people I am four years and three months old, you know. <laughs> As you start your journey, you really have two choices. You actually really don't have much. You have two choices. You lead your life out of love or you lead your life out of fear. It's simple. And leading your life out of fear is all thinking about what can go wrong. Can I get the right job? Can I do the right career? Will I fulfill my potentials? Will I earn enough income? Will I find the love of my life? Will I have the right house, the right car, the right children? I don't know. You're free to do that. Actually, 90% of people do. The devil is within, you know. Do think about all these whispers. Or you can choose your life out of love and love is abundance love there's all the possibilities there is uh, it's not will I earn the light right living it doesn't matter and the right living will come on to you now I you know there's I struggled as I lived my life as I lived my life but no regrets but I can only tell you one thing when I started as a 23-year-old kid, starting Women for Women International, which is now a major women's organization, most of my friends, actually all of my friends, except my husband at the time, did not make fun of me. All of them made fun of me. All of them said, you are ridiculous. Go get yourself a job. All of them said, what's the point? What, are you trying to be a Mother Teresa? And I kept on saying I have a better fashion sense than her. But, you know, <laughs> but it did not matter. I do. <laughs> and God bless her soul. But all of them ridiculed me. Said that, oh, you're just trying to be my... I'm serious. I, they did use this term. Oh, God, you're boring us with all what's happening in Bosnia and Rwanda. And over the years... You know, over the years, these people are very proud of me. And they come and they say, oh, Zainab is our friend. The truth is it doesn't matter whether they are, obviously it didn't matter what they thought, but what matters is if I die today, I will, honest to God, die a very happy, content, fulfilled woman. Because I walked my journey and made mistakes with it, but jumped off the cliff as I started something that was ridiculous at the time. Do you know how many jokes we got on the name Women for Women? I will not explain, but you just change the middle word and you'll go ahead with it. You know, it's, it's a lot of fun. But, so, do you know how many jokes, I mean, I still get jokes of, oh, Women for Women. Even when I go to like political meetings, but this very thing led to a hundred million dollars, 300,000, 315,000 women, millions of people. And its impact was beyond the women, it was the husbands. 
You know how many husbands come and say thank you for making our wives happy? Or children who are happy? And I say that because don't wait to fulfill your potentials. If you, whatever you want to do, do it right now. Don't wait until you're much older and you're retired. And there is such a thing as age, by the way. You do get allergic to food and then your body is not necessarily functioning the same way. So please don't wait. Do it right now. And the very things that you're afraid of, the money and the love and all of that, will come through. It's your choice. You can jump off the cliff and fulfill your potential and give it a chance at least. Or you can go and kill it and numb it for now. And one day you still have to deal with it. So if I, there's anything that I could share, is that this journey, some people tell me, really, but, you know, young people will not take it, you know, would you have taken all what you are, you're doing right now if you're young? I don't know, but, you know, maybe 1% was dick. And I wish I had some of that 1%. Because I would have realized that the journey is not a warrior's journey. It's not in the old movies of the warrior with the horse and the armors and the sword and trying to go to save the world. I really try to do it this way. Not physically with the attire of Xena Warrior Princess, but you know, it was very much with the same spirit. La 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 la, you know? <laughs> Although you are a bit young for Xena Warrior Princess, I don't know if you know it, you know? <laughs> I really did do that and came a full circle to realize, get off the horse. Put the armor down. The world changed the same in injustice that I feel so passionate about to change. Does not change out of anger. It can only change out of love. And that brothel owner could never have told me what he has told me if I was furious and angry at him, though he stands for everything I am against. But the only way to change him or the red light, the only way to get a rapist to talk about how he raped is to meet them out of love. As odd as this may sound and maybe goofy, So I will end with a Rumi, it was a 13th century Sufi poet, and he says, out beyond the walls of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field. I shall meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the, the world is too full to talk about. <coughs> Ideas, language, even the phrase each other no longer makes any sense. <coughs> Whatever path you end up taking, and I do hope you do take the path of service, whatever service you may define it as, there is a world of right doings and wrong doings. I look forward to meet you in the field. Thank you. We have time for some questions, and Salve has graciously uh, agreed to answer some questions. Um, I don't believe we have microphones being run in the auditorium, so I'll ask. We do. We do. We have microphones. Um, so um, I'm going to let you call on people as they raise their hand. Um, we have microphones, so please wait until the microphone comes to you uh, and uh, take it away. Is it on? Hello? Well, <coughs> go ahead. Um, what would you, what would you recommend we do in terms of domestic political action? 
um, in order to advance the position of women both domestically and internationally? I mean, there's so many issues, right? Domestically, there are so many. It depends on which issues you work on. The only, there's no, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer in here. And there's also no right path or wrong path. It's just go all the path. But the only thing I can tell you is what I have done is I actually use the work of American women and the ch on the challenges they face as a modeling to open up discussions that are very hard to open and I'll tell you wh what I mean I was and the first happened in Bosnia and then since then we have done it all over the countries and they all work fantastic often women blame themselves on domestic violence in at least many parts of the world <coughs> she feels she's the one who is doing something wrong and that's why he's beating her and there was a time in Bosnia in which I was with a group of about 40 women and one of them was severely beaten and we tried to bridge the subject and all of them said, no, 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 we don't have such an issue. One woman said, my husband treats me equally. He just beats me up between now and then, but he treats me equally, don't worry. You know, so the only way was like, no, there was no way to actually open up that subject. And finally I said, well, let me tell you about so-and-so story in America. And they're all like, what? And obviously, domestic violence exists in America. Actually, its, its rate has not been reduced in the last 30 years, despite of legal reforms in the process. Very good legal reforms, but the rate of domestic violence has not been re reduced. But I talked about an American woman who faced domestic violence and all the steps she had to do to save herself from the process. And it was in the vulnerability of America that opened up the Bosnian women at the time and since then all over the world really of talking about their domestic violence because there's a like there's like oh it happens in America and I was like yeah it happens to America and that was like okay and out of that 40 women about half of them raised their hands after that story and said okay it happens to us now here's we I'll take the part about America and, and globally America is a leader in the world now, a lot of people see that leader, at least the women in that leadership space, as all Wonder Woman. You know, I've, I've met many, 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 many women all over the world. So, well, if I'm in America, I can also be successful and nice and all of that. I'm just because I'm in this country, I'm doomed, you know. Now, there's a truth to that. I, I'm, I'm personally one of those people very grateful to this country. If it wasn't for America, I don't think I could do the journey I have done in my life. Really, I'm incredibly grateful. On the other hand, there's also the humanization <laughs> as a, as, of America. Good leadership is leadership that shows vulnerability. We are not in a Wonder Woman outfit. That's also outdated for you, but you know, it's my age, you know, I'm talking, to, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know. And so if to actually take the Wonder Woman outfit and say, here is, this is the American woman. Here's the story that we face. Thus, there is nothing better heart opening and bridge making than that. I, just last week, I was talking with a friend who was hugely accomplished, was going to Jordan and was very worried about doing anything and saying anything to Jordanians because she said, I don't know anything and I don't want to tell them about my success and I want to really learn about them. And I was telling her, well, let me just tell you, what are you just... What your attitude can piss off people because it's like, oh God, here is this American coming and just curious about our culture and not really necessarily telling us anything about who they are. It's just, a, you know, it's just like a one way curiosity. But if you switch the discussion and if you say, here is who I am, this is my story, this is how I'm dealing with the issues that I'm being challenged with and make it real. And make it from the heart because the heart has a common language. There is no Japanese and French and Arabic in it, you know. It's the same language. Then you actually can get so much more information about the Jordanian culture. So much more because you have just actually communicated your story as an American woman, which is not a wonder woman, but an, a woman who has plenty of opportunities and a woman who is also struggling to find her peace. And that's for me how there is a, it's almost... So I want to do, um, uh, you know, something that explains America to the world as much as explains the world to America. It, and, 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 and do that bridge both ways, because right now it's not a mutual bridge. I hope I answered. 
Any other questions? There? Okay. I don't want to start any other organizations, but if I have the energy, <laughs> I would do men for men. And I came, I can only tell you about my journey. I moved from being very angry at men for all the rapes and the crimes and the wars and the things that they have led to finally, like to actually a couple of experiences when I was like, huh? And I backed off and I was like, oh my God. I have been cornering men as bad as much as women are being cornered as victims. Or rather, cornering men as aggressors as much as women are being cornered as victims. And both are wrong. There is the good, the bad, and the ugly exist in all of us, in the women and in the men. And my, one of the moments that changed that I realized I am prejudiced in my anger, in my women's rights, I became prejudiced against men, was actually was in Afghanistan. We were, we were sitting with a, in an internally displaced camp in, in Afghanistan, and two turban-looking, long beard men start walking toward us. As far as I know, they look like the Taliban. I had no distinct, distinction between, it was just like long beard, there's the thing, all of these things. And I was like, oh my God, it's the Taliban. They're going to come and kill us. And I was telling my staff, let's go, let's go, let's run to the car and just zoom out of there. And they're like, no, let's just calm down. Let's just see, we don't, let's just see what the situation is. And, and these older, two older men walk to us. And as I'm thinking, really, they're going to yell at us because we're working with women and all of that. They actually said, we are here to thank you for actually all the work you're doing with our women, and we really appreciate it, and we want to thank you on behalf of all men. And it was, I was more like, huh? And, it, and that's the moment that I realized I have become such prejudiced in my women's rights thing against men that I am missing out actually on how do you, how do you actually make the change. And in the process, I embarked on the most. And this is where I really start changing my view. If we want equality in here, we cannot do the same thing to there. If we want justice to our image, we cannot marginalize someone else's image. Yeah. And in the process, I came to realize, and these are men in very hard circumstances, in Bosnia and Congo and Sudan and, and Iraq, I came to realize they are, they are in a black hole. Like no, while there are so many services for women, there are no services for men. Where women, while women are allowed to cry and to share their stories, there is no thing like that for men. He moves from being the soldier to having a job and to be continuing the aggression. And I have been able to actually talk with amazing men, men who did not want to kill, men who did not want to rape, men who are disgusted with this, but there is no space for them. There is no space to engage for them. Now, I'm not saying all, but just like I don't believe anymore all women are victims, you know, I, and I moved from that, is to do that, what I'm saying is that there are wonderful men out there and there are really bad ones. And we have to create the space and listen and hear the good man, to create a room for them to join. Because if we only see if, and I'm sharing my experience, I really was so angry at men. And I moved only in the last decade of my life to say, oh my God, it's a world I need to explore with respect. And you meet the good and the bad and the ugly. Now, is there possibilities to change? Of course. You know, there are, there's an incredible men's movement in Congo by Dr. McWega who says 90% of men don't rape. Why do we give the reputation of all men as rapists when only 10% or less rape? And it's a movement by men against rape. 
there is a great organization called Men's Up by Jimmy Bricks, who talks about actually how to have men, and particularly men in sport, to stand up against domestic violence. They are now, there's so much more needed. But what we do need is to create the space for men. And it's an emerging issue. There are not too many services. There is a group who did research. Only some services are provided to men in Africa and in Latin America, but like very handful. And there is nothing usually in the rest part of the world. And so what I would argue is say we need to actually provide more space for men to work on their emotional whatever evolution, just like we do on women. And it is possible. It is absolutely possible. We have at Women for Women created a men's training program targeting rebel uh, tr commanders, chiefs, uh, whatever, you know, whoever the leaders are in the communities. It could be the pastor, the imam, the chief, the commander, the whatever, the community leader. And it's a four, four weeks training program for men saying, if you want to be a good leader, You've got to understand what women have to say about things. Now, we have had amazing stories. One of them is a man, and people get horrified when I tell the story, so please bear with me, a commander who said, you know, before I entered this program, whenever I entered another man's home and I had the gun and he didn't have the gun, I never thought twice about raping his wife. I always raped the wife. Until I realized I could get HIV and I could die and I could kill my family, and half of my soldiers could die. So I stopped raping. Now, a lot of people, when I stop the story here, get, oh my God, how, like, this horrible, horrible, he's stopping rape only because of HIV. And don't, doesn't he know that? No, he didn't know that, first of all. Really, he did not know that. So awareness is very important. We need to reach out. How can we create change if all what we do is be angry at it? You need to reach out. Second, that if we judge him at that point, then we, yes, it's a horrible man who just made a very practical judgment that no man, no soldier should rape because they will get HIV and he doesn't want his soldiers to die. But a year later, I went to visit that same guy. And he said, you know, in the process, I end up spending more time with my wife. And it was different. And I started telling her little by little, as I spend more time with her, we start trusting each other. So I start telling her how much I make. And she started telling me how much she made. And eventually, after six months, we started saving together. Six weeks or whatever. After six months, we moved from a straw hut to a mud home. Much better. And he says, now I spend all my time with her, going from one neighbor to another and telling them how happy I am. Oh, could happy stories be like that? Yes, it can. Could there be change? Yes, I believe in the possibilities of change. Otherwise, no one should be in the business of service if you don't believe in change. But does that mean, and this is a bad story, this is a hard story, it's not easy. This is a rapist who have done the transformation and he still need to have a, to deal with the punitive aspect of what he has done. But can there be, be transformation? Yes, and we can only go about transformation if we stop being so angry at it. We, look, we have to look at it. We have to do the change in a different way. And men, we need more dialogue and more opening with them. Other questions? Yeah? Um, can I ask you a very practical question? Yes. Uh, you talk a lot about I use translators, that's that all the times, but I also um, teach myself the practical words. How much is this? Take me to this place, and I remember the answers. So I negotiate. I love negotiations. I embarrass my friends when I'm in a taxi. It's like, no, absolutely not. You have to do that. But it's a uh, part of the practice. So it's more my gestures than uh, the language. But I, I really rem memorize the practical things I need to memorize and the answers that I need to get. And that's how I survive in urgent situations. But otherwise, I always have a translator. And there are always nice, beautiful people in the world. Yes? When you're working in countries other than your own, have you ever encountered situations where the local people say, 
why are you interfering in our lives and what responsibilities do you have or what what motivates you to to help us if we're not your own people? Actually, I got the hardest time from my own people. I'm serious. They're like, who the heck are you? You've been in America for 20 years and now you come and tell us what to do? You don't know exactly what we have gone through. I still get attacked by my own people. <laughs> I smile at it when they, I understand, it's okay, they, they have the right. Um, I have had a better life than most Iraqis have had. It's true, I don't deny. Um, but when they, but rarely, those who have done this was not necessarily, were more like the, uh, in lectures or whatever, it's uh, more, I, I haven't, I mean, really the only people I have gotten it from is from Iraqis, but it was more from the hotel service, you know, receptionist, uh, that I was, whatever, there was issues with the hotel bill, they were more like, not from the women that we work with, Never from the women that we work with, but I wouldn't doubt that there will be in the back room whispers like, who the heck is this, you know, and why are you here? And I, I really, I believe this happens, not necessarily with me only, but with a lot. And that's why I talk about the respect. Because when you don't have the respect, then you trigger the, you know, the, er the, the anger of the other person. You know, here they come imposing their values on us, imposing their, because in other countries I am the foreigner, imposing all these stuff on us, they are not from our cultures, they don't understand. I think such attitude encourage corruption because it is, oh, here it is, you know, here's the West coming and pouring on us and we, they don't respect us, so why should we respect them? So here's the corruption. So I think it's how you carry yourself that can trigger the good positive response or the negative response. I really do believe that, and I've seen both of them. Since um, America has entered uh, you know, nations like Iraq 10 years ago, have you seen any changes socially in, the, in, Iraq, in, in Iraq socially or culturally? And are these for the better or worse? There have been lots of changes in terms of women or generally? Women went really backwards socially. They have improved legally on particular issues only, as in they have now equal citizenship. Before in Iraq's time, in Saddam's time, if I married a foreigner, my, my children cannot carry an Iraqi passport. Now the reform was my children can, and so that I'm an equal citizen to man. They have gained legally, as in they have more percentage of women representation in the parliament now. 33% of the Iraqi parliament are women. And they are more in the diplomatic core. That's a gain. Socially and economically, they went backward, not one step, a lot of steps. It's, uh, you know, my mother was, uh, just to give you an example, uh, was going to college, uh, was a working mother, was uh, all of these things, and now I, grew up driving in Iraq and going to university and it's all normal and now I, I younger women ask me did you really drive when you were in Iraq or did you really not cover your hair when you were in Iraq and in my times there was time in which and, and I have no issues with hair covering just to put that on the record but it was the majority of women would go just like that and it's not the same anymore at all so be, and the re the reason for the for the retrieval is because of the bad security so because there was such bad security women sat, and that's always happens women start retreating home because you get harassed and you, I mean, this, not only security, I mean, in Iraq, to go to a school is like going to a war zone, you know, you're going through checkpoints and all of these things. But the more these bombings and happens and happens, all of these things, people start retreating back home. And the first wave that retreat back home is women. They have no choice. I mean, the, uh, the men have no choice but to go. And so I would argue Iraqi women went, took a major step in the back and socially, in the social norms, not necessarily in the legal way. Socially, in my generation, impossible to think about uh, multiple marriages, which is legal in Islam. But like everyone looked down at it. It's like, ugh, 
it's outdated all of these things now young women um, are are engaged in 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 polygamy um, in my generation you have to be much older you graduate from university to 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 get married still young but but that's the age right now in decrease of marriage is going to 16 years old women as more the common than the older ones you know so it's really it's degenerated in a in a serious way that's because the country changed i mean that because you have more religious you have definitely more religious elements in the country in terms of leadership of the country religion moved from being a very private space to a very public space and then because of the security are really bad was really really bad and when the first when the invasion first happened this did not happen overnight so the first six months women were going out and all of that but a lot of the kidnappings i mean um, americans are familiar with the kidnappings that happened in iraq the first kidnappings that happened was against iraqis and about a lot of them were women some of them, my friends, who were dragged out of their pharmacies and out of their offices and assassinated and killed because they were active women. So there was definitely an attack on women, and there is definitely bad security, and there is definitely a criticism of how America handled women's issues, as in when it first came, America did a lot of symbolic, uh, took women as a symbolic gesture, but not as a serious way. And it, dis it dismayed a lot of Iraqi women who thought, America comes and now we're going to have 50% of representation and everything is okay and that was definitely not on the agenda and or or actually the at least in that particular administration and as I met with a lot of Americans in the you know in the Iraq in Iraq governing Iraq in the beginning it's not even in their awareness about women's issues so so there was a, it's a combination of many things as my aunt says Iraqis were really bad, and Americans were bad too, and between the two of us, we destroyed the country. Yeah. Thank you.